Welcome to the Grace Vineyard Podcast, where we are building growing communities of worshipers who are becoming like Christ, empowered to do His work. We hope you enjoy this message. Does anyone know what we were talking about? What, what book of the Bible are we studying? Woo, good class. So who wrote it? And tell me about John. What's he like? How's he feeling? What's he looking like? Most loved. <clears throat> Excuse me, what else? He likes koinonia. We'll have to figure out what that word means. He likes koinonia. Anything else? He's super old. Like, how old is he? He's in his, like, 90s probably, right? He's the last living apostle. So the, the dynamic is we're reading this book, but we're approaching it. It's, it's a letter that he wrote. It's a pretty short letter. It's called First John. It's the first of three letters that we have. He's the same guy that wrote the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's the same guy that wrote the Revelation. The last He wrote a lot of the Bible. So he's that guy, and he's like Grandpa John to us, only he's not old and tottering. You know, hello, how are you doing, kids? He's, he's got more energy than I have, probably. Do you want me to do that again, Ernesto? <laughs> Drop the glasses. Hello, class. <laughs> um, so, so John is old, but he's energetic. He's joyful. And what I noticed when I was reading through and looking for a, a kind of a title for a series is that he seems to be thriving in life. So I called this series, as we're reading this, this book together, Thriving for a Lifetime. Because I want to learn from John's teaching, and I want to learn from his example how I, too, can thrive for my entire life, and I figured you probably would like to learn that too. So that's kind of the focus we've been, we've been going at, and um, it's, it's, it's like we're in the living room, this elder apostle is there, and he's sharing with us wisdom, and we're in awe, because he's the last living of the 12 apostles. None of us have ever seen Jesus in person, but John did. John was there when there was that great cache of fish that sunk the boats, and John was in the other boat and helped him. And he was just starting to follow him. We're like, ah, wow. John was there when Jesus walked on the water. Can you, if you knew this guy, wouldn't you be like asking some questions? You're like, he shows up, I'm showing up, I want to meet this guy. John was there on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured, became white, bright light, and was talking with Moses and Elijah. John was there At the Last Supper, he was the closest one sitting next to Jesus. He's got something to say. He's the one that whispered to Jesus, who's the one that's going to betray you? And Jesus told him, it's Judas. He was like tight with Jesus. He was there on that horrible day of the crucifixion. Do you remember when Jesus, on the cross, dying for my sins, looks down and says, John, here's your mother. And he's pointing to his own mother, Mary. I'm leaving and I'm putting her in your care. So John is the one who took care of Mary as if she were his own mother. He was there at the resurrection. He saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. He was there when Jesus returned to heaven. He was there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And he was in that room. And suddenly he began speaking in tongues with the other ones. Have you read that story? So here we are listening to this guy. It's many years later. It's probably around 90 AD. So it's like 60 years after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. So it's like, wow. And we're listening to him. And we're learning about how we too can thrive for a life. So that, that's, the, that's the attitude we have in approaching this. So I told you a few weeks ago, and I tested you a few weeks ago, and you, did, you passed in living color. And great, you did great. See if you can remember, I taught you from the first chapter three things. We called it the three braided strands of a thriving life. Do you remember those three? Koinonia. So the first thing was we said we should prioritize a weird word called koinonia. What was koinonia? So they're mumbling, Zoom people. They said fellowship. So koinonia is the Greek word, and we thought we better look at the Greek word because John wrote in Greek. And in our English translation, it talks about, he writes about us having fellowship. Well, in, in English, that sounds like, you know, let's go to lunch at Ty's Burger House today and have some fellowship. But that word does not, does not give enough uh, oomph to it. It's not enough strength, not enough bite. The word in Greek implies 
a deep community, a co-sharing, a sharing of life, a sharing of purpose, a sharing of resources, a coming together in worship, a coming together in doing the works of God, where we are arm in arm, loving each other and loving the world together, doing things like taking care of orphans around the world together, which is something we're doing right now, right? So koinonia is that word that means that deep kind of fellowship. The first strand was prioritize in your life koinonia. Remember that because I'm going to say something more about that in a second. We also said, by the way, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, that the right pronunciation is gunanija because the implication is in koinonia, I need you and you need me and a time's coming when I'm going to be in some trouble. And that's going to come in my life and in your life. If you didn't notice, you will have trouble in your life. Hello? It's not a trouble-free life. You'll have trouble, but the problems that you have, you don't have to face alone because we are in deep koinonia fellowship with each other when we prioritize koinonia so that we can live a thriving life. All that was just in some of the words John wrote. What was the second of those three? Wow, you guys are good. Living in the light. So he wrote that and said... Your children, walk in the light. As Jesus is in the light, walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness. And we kind of built that out, talked about what all that might mean, and you probably got a glimpse already. It has to do with walking in truth, walking in the right way, not walking in the wrong way, avoiding sin, living in righteousness. And if you fall into, fall off kind of into the ditch on the side of the road of living in the light and get in the mud, quickly get cleaned up by going to Jesus, confessing, your sins, and he will quickly forgive them and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and you're back and walking in the light. So prioritize koinonia, walk in the light. What was the third one? Walk in the way of love. You guys are excellent disciples. Walk in the way of love. And that was defined by Jesus, where he used words like, no greater love has this than a man lay down his life for a friend. I've laid down my life for you, so you also should lay down your lives for each other. And it's, it's kind of bigger than I'm willing to die for you. It's, it's more like I'm willing to lay aside my preferences, my priorities, to esteem your life more important than mine, and I treat you that way. I walk in the way of love. So those three were the things for a thriving life, and I want to just go back to the prioritizing koinonia because there might have been something that we forgot about. Let me read it to you from 1 John 1. This is how John opened up his letter. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at, which our hands have touched, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life, speaking of the person of Jesus himself. The life appeared, bless you, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. Did you hear all those words? We saw that which is indescribable. The, the meaning, the, the meaning behind everything, life itself. We saw that esoteric concept, hard to understand. We saw it in the person of Jesus, and we want to proclaim to you what we've experienced in Jesus. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may also have koinonia with us. And our koinonia is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Here was the point. For thriving in life, we prioritize koinonia, that fellowship, by making sure, you listening, to constantly tell others about our experience with Jesus so they too can have fellowship with us and the Father and the Son. That's the main key to thriving for John. He's joyfully, in his old age, once again telling people, I met life itself. I met Jesus. You can have life itself, too. You can have Jesus. Follow me. Follow Jesus. Let's do this together. And he's constantly inviting people in, and he's thriving in life as a result. Let that just sit on you for a second. I have a simple challenge for each one of us who calls ourselves followers of Jesus. Can you commit to making one disciple in the next year? 
can you think, I'm going to make it my goal to help someone else become a follower of Jesus with me? Just one. And after you get that one, then you can do the next one. But don't worry about the next one, just today. (laughs) Just one. Just one. Make it a priority to have people join you in Koinonia. Here's a practical thing. Today is April. Next week is April. Guys, you're supposed to talk back to me. And the week after that is April. What happens on April 17th? Easter Sunday. He is risen right now, this moment. Get someone in your mind that's not in fellowship with Jesus. And they're in your contact list. And possibly pull out your phone this moment. Text them and say, hey, I was just thinking about you and wanted, you to, wanted to invite you to come to church on Easter Sunday in two weeks with me. I'll come and get you. And you'll be making yourself available to help someone join you in fellowship with the Father and the Son. It just got quiet in here. Ron, you're asking so much. (laughs) Seriously, how fun would it be if we were a people who were so prioritizing fellowship, koinonia fellowship, that we were constantly looking for the next person to invite to join us? Okay, so we're getting into chapter 4, but I wanted to get those, those three points in our minds again. Chapter 4, well, I'm going to read to you starting um, in the last sentences of chapter 3. Verse 23 of chapter 3, John is talking at this point in the letter about the, the problem of, of people sometimes having a guilt about the mistakes they've made and wondering, am I really in? Am I really in with the Lord? And he's told them, yes, you've put your faith in Jesus That's it. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's how grace works. He writes this. This is his command. It's an A and B command, two-part command. This is his command, which we've heard, which we've, oh, this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. You might think of it this way. I breathe in, I believe in Jesus, I breathe out loving others. It's It's that simple. It's like a When you breathe in Jesus, you naturally love others. You see that? This is his command. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us, those who obey these commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by his spirit that he gave us. When we believe in Jesus, we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now the next sentence is connected to that. Dear friends... This is another principle for thriving for a lifetime. And it's kind of a big shift from what we were just talking about. So hang on as we change lanes. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. We know it by the spirit that he's given us was the last sentence, the next sentence. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, just notice, he didn't say, don't believe every prophet because many false prophets have gone into the world. He could have said that, and it seems like that would have communicated well, but he chose to say it this way. Test the spirits because many false prophets have gone into the world. And he's emphasizing something that we forget in our culture a lot because we're quite proud of our technology and the advances we've made. After all, people have walked on the moon. Aren't we smart? You know, we've got the internet. I've got the internet in my pocket. I can ask Google anything and know everything. Aren't we smart? We've solved all the world's problems, haven't we? (laughs) John wants us to know that there is a spiritual realm that's on scene, and there's spiritual forces behind everything. Test the spirits, because not every spirit is the spirit of God. And when people speak words about revelation or they lead us in spiritual experiences, it's not necessarily that they're of God. 
So we need to learn how to test the spirits. I could say it this way for this, today's aspect of thriving in life. Learn to discern. Learn to discern. Why? Well, there are many false prophets. Where do they, where do they get their false prophetic experience? From not the Spirit of God, but John will say quickly, the Spirit of Antichrist. Oh, now you're all negative, Ron. Why'd you have to go there? Because this is reality. Folks, not every spiritual experience is from God. And I am certain that in this room, there's not a ton of us in here and online, that some of you, maybe many of you, have had spiritual experiences that felt good. Many people, many that I encounter, don't have any idea that a good, quote-unquote, spiritual experience might not be from God. It might actually be dangerous. I wonder if you perhaps in this room had your tarot cards read and had a good experience and had no idea that you were toying with the spirit of Antichrist and it wasn't a good spirit because you didn't test the spirit. Maybe, maybe you played with a Ouija board when you were a kid and something happened. I've heard many stories of children Sleepover, 12-year-old, pull out the Ouija, let's play a Ouija board. Anyone ever, you want to admit you've actually did that when you were a kid? And did anyone do that and have an experience? Some have. Not a play, Parker Brothers or whoever made the game, but literally something spiritual. Many of you have had great experiences when someone was praying for you. Something spiritual happened. I'm trying to dial up in our awareness that there are spiritual experiences most of us have had. Few of us talk about them, but when you get people in a conversation, trust me, if you do this, you will find that almost everybody has had some kind of experience in their life, maybe many that they can't explain in science. They can't explain in natural terms. Something happened. Some people have used mushrooms to go connect with the universe, the higher powers, right? And had a spiritual experience and felt like it was really positive and had no idea to test the spirits. Are we hopefully getting real? <laughs> so I see hands raised. So, um, <laughs> the Bible teaches that not every experience is from God that's spiritual. It teaches that Satan, the prince of demons, mask, you might not know this, so listen, he masquerades as an angel of light. That's the good ones. And he's a good, he has a good disguise. Here's what the Bible says. Paul is talking about false apostles, false teachers. He says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, Workmen masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Feel the warning getting there? Listen to Paul's instruction to young Timothy, a man that he set in a place to oversee a church that Paul had established in Ephesus. In the letter to Timothy in the Bible, Paul writes this. These are... These are Intriguing, frightening words. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The Spirit very clearly says that some will abandon the faith. In other words, they were in the church, and they abandoned the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. It's important to learn to discern if you want to thrive for a lifetime. How are you doing? Let's do, some, let's do some practical. I'll give you a situation and you help me discern it, okay? So uh, my mom is dead. 
and she is actually. My mom died a, a long time ago now, 1990. So I'm missing her. And I've heard that she's, you know, they, someone, lots of people told me, don't worry, your mom is always with you. She's overlooking you. She's overseeing you. Your mom's always with you. And I think I'd like to know about this. So I go and see a spiritual person, a spiritist, who does, has a little glass ball and does a little work and contacts my mom. And she speaks and says nice things, and I feel really good. How was that experience? <laughs> so it might have been a fake. <laughs> Minus fifty dollars, he said. Wouldn't surprise me if some of you in this room have been in that situation. I've had the conversations. So test the spirits. What do, what do we know about that experience? My, shouldn't be looking at a glass ball. <laughs> Yeah, so, so Zondia says, how can we discount that that person doesn't actually speak with spirits? I wouldn't discount it. I would say she actually speaks with spirits. That's what I would say. But does, do we have some teaching about whether this is a good spirit or a bad spirit? Not working with God. So you guys are doing pretty good. And, we're gonna, and John's going to talk some specifics, but I'm just testing you. <laughs> You're doing good. Um, how about... I going to have a challenging day ahead of me, and I know I'm born in December, and that makes me a Sagittarius. So I, I go and look at my horoscope to learn about my personality and how the stars were aligned when I was born and get a prediction of how my day is going to go. So that, and, and, and it feels pretty encouraging after I do it, pretty positive for my day. I, I go into the day with energy. Now I know what's going to happen. Test the spirits. How's that? Witchcraft. There's actually some truth to that. So many Christians don't know that the horoscope, which you might think is a toy, but it's not, more real than false, but not real by God. Um, here's, here's a, the Bible is helpful in this, by the way. Here's, here's a scripture way back in the time when, it's not on your screen, by the way, when, when the people of Israel are becoming a nation and they're going to go into their promised land that God's giving them, God, through Moses, is giving them warning. And he says this, When you enter the land your God has given you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who, this one's easy, who sacrifices their son or daughter into the fire. Well, I wouldn't do that. Or who practices divination. Oh, that's the person that talks to the dead. Or sorcery, interprets omens. That's astrology. Engages in witchcraft, casts spells, who's a medium or a spiritist, who consults the dead. Anyone, this is tough words, people. Can I read tough words from the Bible? You sure? You won't be offended? Okay. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. That's what he said to Israel. You must... Be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet among you, like me. And that's Jesus, by the way, that he's referring to. Okay, so I'm physically not feeling very well. So I go to a Reiki practitioner to get a Reiki massage. <laughs> Have you heard of Reiki? Here, let me read to you. Reiki theory holds that practitioners can channel the universal life force as a healing energy into the client's body in order to balance and enhance the flow of vital energy. The client or patient lies on a table as the... This is really popular right now. The Reiki practitioner gently touches him or her. The practitioner places their palms on major organs and glands on the areas where the chakras are located. The chakras are part of the Hindu belief that there are seven chakras, centers of psychic and spiritual energy, going from the base of the spine to the top of the head. Certain Hindu teachings claim that the kundalini, an energy force coiled snake-like in the base chakra, needs to rise to the topmost chakra as spiritual enlightenment takes place. So the, the practitioner massages and holds their hands over you, 
for several minutes and they draw the universal energy into you and line your chakras and you feel better. And by the way, people that do this have a good experience. So does that mean it's from the Spirit of God because it was good? Learn to discern. Well, if it's a Christian practitioner doing Christian healing, yes, but if they're invoking the universal spiritual life force, that's not Christian. So here's something that's really important that we're going to learn. Um, how you guys doing? This is real life. Oh, that was Deuteronomy. The one, big one I read, that was Deuteronomy 18. How about this one? I'm not feeling very great, and I go to a church service, and I, say, and I go to the front, and they pray for me, and when they're praying for me, something weird happens. I begin to feel weak, and I literally fall to the floor and lie down because I'm so weak. Something's happened. They continue to pray over me, and I'm, I'm almost passed out. It's a, it's a strange experience, and I begin speaking in a language that I don't know, and, I, and they keep praying for me, and they said that I'm speaking in tongues. And, and I feel like I love Jesus more when I'm out of it. Discern the spirits. Learn to test the spirits. Is this, is this maybe spirit of God or not spirit of God? Why would it be spirit of God? It depends. <laughs> okay, there's good fruit, Jesus. How about this? That is taught directly in the Bible that that happens. So that helps. Learn to discern the spirits. Here's a possible test. Is the thing that I'm experiencing taught in the Bible, modeled in the Bible, or at least tethered to a biblical worldview? So that's why someone practicing Reiki I would have a problem with because what they're doing is not taught in the Bible, modeled in the Bible, or tethered to a biblical worldview, but it is tethered to something that's forbidden. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic, but we need to test the spirits, whether they be of God or not. Another question. This is a class time. How do you not know that Satan likes to enslave things that are spiritual? So this is a great question, Zondia. And... I think I'm going to describe that in the next section of reading through John. And if we don't get to it, let's talk some more. But I think this will help. It's a great question. She says, so how do you know? How do you know it's God or how do you know it's not? What if I feel like I love Jesus more? Maybe it was a good experience. So, um, by the way, here's another place in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. So check this out. The word test that we've been reading, test of spirits, has to do with the kind of language like someone who is looking at something that looks like a diamond, confirming that it's a real diamond and not a fake diamond. So a gemologist can tell you, oh, that's a real diamond and it's quality, or they can tell you, no, that's a cubic zirconia. And the, the point is um, to not... Test the spirits because you're looking to condemn something, but it's more of an attitude of looking to test the spirits with the hope that you are proving something because you see that it's of God. So there's not this judgmental attitude, looking for everything, you know, looking for demons behind every rock, <laughs> looking for everything that's wrong, but an attitude that says, I need to test the spirits because not every spirit is of God, but some are of God, and when they are of God, I want to push into it and just embrace what God is doing. And when they're not of God, I want to be careful because I want to thrive for a lifetime. And John is warning us as we're sitting around his feet, you guys, you got to be careful because not everything that looks white is white. So test the spirits. Learn to discern. Okay, so back to where we were in, in 1 John. The next thing he says, and, and I'm switching, by the way, to uh, the English Standard Version translation for a particular reason. He's going to talk about those that confess Jesus. Um, the NIV says acknowledge, and it's not quite strong enough word. I'll explain that in a second, but here we go. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, 
which you heard was coming and now is already in the world. So he's talking about what, what is the Jesus, the, the person that you're testing the spirit behind them, what Jesus are they bringing to you? Is it the true Jesus, or do they use the name Jesus and refer to a different Jesus? Many people do. But the Jesus that John saw, that he talked with, that he knew, that he experienced, was Jesus who was fully human and fully God, who died for his sins and raised from the dead physically, and he put his faith in him. There were in John's time already people saying, well, Jesus wasn't really human. He was just a spiritual being. There were the Gnostics, yes. There were other people who would say, well, Jesus wasn't really God. He was just a good man. So, Zondia, this is where I hope it's a good, question, a good answer to your question. A great question is to ask, does the person, the spirit behind whom I'm testing, bring a true Jesus that they confess? See, everyone who confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. What he's saying is, confess means to acknowledge the truth and to give my life to the truth. I am one who's following Jesus, who came in the flesh, but was fully God, who died for my sins and rose from the dead. Now, if the person who is practicing some kind of healing prayer is fully a person who says, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, fully human, fully God, died for my sins, rose from the dead, is seated at the right hand of God, is God, then I'm in good shape. But you know the person that knocks on my door that says, yeah, I believe in Jesus, he's my Savior. And then we talk some more and they say, well, he's also, he's not really God. He's uh, a son of God that was created by God. And, um, uh, and his brother is Lucifer. And so that person has probably knocked on your door because they are part of a religious system that uses the name of Jesus in a different way than you really mean. See the deception? We, if we're going to thrive in life, are going to experience all sorts of spiritual things. We're going to have spiritual revelation. There'll be prophetic stuff. There'll be spiritual experiences. And we, if we want to thrive for a lifetime, need to learn to discern because there is a spirit of Antichrist at loose in the world. And many Christians fall prey to the spirit of Antichrist. Let's see if there's more to read. There are people who have the right words, but their lifestyle doesn't match what they say. Do you know those people? Paul describes them like this in his letter to Timothy, I mean to Titus. Titus 4, 6, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. So is the person that we're interested in thinking, hmm, something doesn't feel right? committed to the true Jesus, and does their lifestyle match the words of commitment to the true Jesus? If it doesn't, then I want to be careful. Is that, is that okay with you? You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm saying people that are becoming disciples of Jesus, I hope that all of us are fully engaged in the full life of the Spirit of God, the full life of following Jesus, all the experiences that he could possibly have, the Holy Spirit. There is a spiritual realm. Miracles happen. We have spiritual experiences, but not every spiritual experience is from God, and we can be deceived if we don't learn how to test the Spirit. So a really important thing is the person that's doing the spiritual experience or bringing the revelation or the prophecy or the teaching are they in harmony with and are they presenting the true Jesus or is it another Jesus? And you don't get that from the first sentence when they say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Your spiritual healer person that's contacting the dead on your behalf might say, oh, I believe in Jesus. But is it the true Jesus and is their life conformed to him? Do they confess him? Confession means I believe he's true and I've given my life to his cause. I'm one of his. I'm a disciple of his. Test the spirits. 
see if they're of God or not? Do they confess the true Jesus and don't be in fear? Here's the next verse. You, dear children, are from God, and you've overcome them. Remember where we started? You have believed in Jesus. You believed in his name. You breathed him in, and you're breathing out love. You know this by the spirit that dwells in you. You, dear children, are from God and overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Fear not, the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. They're from the world, therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We're from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. Who's the us that he's referring to? Probably the apostles. Those given the authority to present the word of God by Jesus himself. He includes himself among the apostles whose teaching we have in our hands called the New Testament. That's the teachings of the apostles. We speak from God, and whoever listens to whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever's not from God doesn't listen to us. So there's a test. Where are people in connection with the Word of God? Is it, is it their source of understanding, of truth, their standard for righteousness, for rightness, for life? Or do they discount the Word of God? This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Simple lesson today, I know. But I, I had the impression as I was feeling compelled to just talk about spiritual dynamics, testing the spirits, that there probably would be people here who need to hear what I'm saying. Because some of you may have had spiritual experiences that have deceived you and the light's coming on right now. Some people, happens from time to time, will go into a spiritual experience, go and have their tarot cards read because it seemed like it was fun, go to a seance, and discover that after the spiritual experience, there seems to be something that's changed a present darkness that grips them and causes trouble. I've had this experience with people, and they need prayer to be set free from the darkness that has now gotten a hold of them. That's a reality. What do you think is happening all through the New Testament when we read of Jesus running into people that are afflicted by demonic spirits, and he gets rid of them? That's what's happening. There is a spiritual world. There's a spiritual realm There's a spirit behind the true apostles. His name is the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit behind the false apostles, the false prophets, the false practitioners. His name is the spirit of Antichrist. The ultimate one would be Satan himself. This is a reality that we have to deal with. Follow the way. Prioritize koinonia. Walk in the light. Follow the way of love. Don't love the world was the next thing we saw. Don't love the world or the things of the world, for the world has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember when we read that? These things are not from the Father. Learn not to fall into those. Learn also that we, to thrive, need to test the spirits. Learn to discern. Do these things and you'll thrive for a lifetime. Let's, let's switch gears and let's stand together. And maybe, Amy, you'd like to come up with um, a worship band. Father, we turn to you because we believe that the ultimate source of discerning is from the Holy Spirit himself. So, Holy Spirit, we look to you, our God, and invite you to enlighten our eyes and enlighten our hearts Come, Holy Spirit. We want to enter into a time where you minister to us. Uh, prayer folks that know how to pray for people, you've been through some training here, been on prayer teams. Would you, some of you come to the front? Some of you, as we're experiencing, as we're waiting before the Lord, I think, some of you um, know that God was dealing with you today. It's just some of the words we read out of the Bible. 
and you would do well to go talk to someone and get some prayer. You might find a new freedom in your life. Come and get prayer. I think there'll probably be someone down here. I see some people over here. Um, I have an image that keeps coming to my mind, so I'll just say it. Maybe it's my imagination. Maybe it's real. Um, I see, I think it's two dark spots on someone's lungs. I think it's two. One's bigger than the other. And I just have that thought coming to my mind, and it keeps coming. So that could be, um, possibly, I'm not a prophet, you guys. So it could be that God's letting me know there's someone here who has uh, spots, two of them at least, on your lungs, and it's fearful. And, and you need prayer because God heals. And if that's, if that's your situation, you come and, and grab one of these people. And good chance, if that's your situation, God wants to heal you. So please res- respond to that. Listen, if you're here and you've never given your life fully to Jesus, don't leave here without giving your life to Jesus. We're proclaiming to you that which we have seen and heard and experienced. The life that we all long for is in Jesus. The life is in Jesus. Without him, we are dying. Without him, we are lost in our sin and we can't get out of it. With him, our sins no longer control us. We're no longer condemned, but we are forgiven and justified before God. If you're here and you've never invited Jesus into your life, would you turn to him right now and just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Come into my life. Cleanse me. Wash away my sins. Give me your life instead. And empower me to thrive for all of life as I live in fellowship with you. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. This weekly podcast is available on our website, gracevcf.org, where you can learn more about Grace Vineyard and our vision for people everywhere to know and worship God.